Blessings, blessings, blessings. I'm glad you were able to join me today. I pray that you are living your best life. I don't care what your situation is. Find God in it. And, 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 and understand that God knows where you are. I just want to encourage you for a minute. He says in this life, we will have tribulations. Jesus said we will have tribulations. We will have trials. We will have tribulations. But he also said that when we have these things, he will be in it for us. And the purpose of our trials is so that we will learn perseverance, learn how to persevere in hard times. And then we learn character from it. And he goes on through the, through the New Testament telling us how to go through trials and what those trials teach us. So if you're going through a trial right now, I pray for you that, that this, you know, you'll come out on the side of victory. And I know you will because every trial has an expiration date. So I want you to be encouraged on that, on that particular fact. But here I want to talk about how the enemy attacks his his tactics you know i don't care who you are you need to know who the enemy is you need to know who the enemy oper how the enemy operates and satan is the enemy of our soul and we have to know how he operates and you know anytime, anytime you have a mountain high trust me trust me trust me he's coming for you every time things are great trust me he's coming for you but you have to know that so you can get yourself girded and 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 dress for battle and make sure that you are sound in Jesus Christ because the enemy is coming. But it says here in 1 Peter, verse 8, be sober, be sober minded, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking, he's watching, he's watching, he's watching. You know, if you ever look at different pictures dealing with safaris or, or animal kills. One of the things that you'll notice about a lion, a tiger, and all those, they watch the, they, they, they'll watch the herd to see what that herd what's gonna, is going to do. Now, one thing they watch the herd about, they hope the herd don't run because they usually don't have their tactics where they, they, you know, they go low and they, you know, they, they, they move about the grass as low as they can because they don't want to be seen. And what they would do is sneak up on the prey and then sit down, look at the herd, and watch. What are they watching for? The weak. They're watching those who are slow. And they're watching the young. And the weak meaning could be older, older elderly cattle or whatever they're going after. Or someone is just slow. Maybe they've been injured and they can't go as fast as the rest of the herd. They're looking for the young. Because they can't run as fast as the rest of the herd. You know, so you got the weak and you got the young. And, and then you have those who just are sick. They're coming after the sick. So whether you're slow or you're, or you're sickly or you're young, that's who the lion is going after. And then once he gets to a position that he can, the others start running, then they zoom in on the one that they want. You know, Satan do the same thing. He zoom in on us the same way. You know what he do for us though? He go after the ones that's isolated. You know, you off here dilly dallying, you know, not dealing with the rest of the of the people. You know, you all by yourself. Always want to be by yourself because you're your best friend. He's coming for you. He also comes for those who are, who become discouraged in life. You know, things didn't go their way. Maybe something happened in their life, and 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 they feel discouraged. He's coming after them too, and he comes after the sick. The sick people, when people are sick for so long, you know, they just get to the point that they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he comes and he he, he attacks their minds. And then he goes after the young because they don't know any better. But we have to be sober minded, it said. It says because he comes about like a roaring lion. Now, a lion's roar has no power. The roar has no power. One thing the roar do the roar do is let you know where the lion is, but there's no power. There's no power in that. The power is in the attack. So you have to understand that the attack is going to come. But it says here, it says it says, seeking whom he may devour. Now he's looking. He's scoping. It says resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Resist him. Every thought that comes to your mind, resist the thought. You know, Satan attacks our thoughts or our heart, the things, our emotions. He attacks that. 
He attacks those things that make us who we are. And that's when he comes, he guns for us. We have to know when we're being attacked. And we have to know who the attacker is. Yeah, it might come from a human being, but that's not your attacker. Your attacker is the enemy. It's old Satan himself who is attacking through a human being. And so I want to talk about that attack situation right now. Because he has strategies when he's attacking us. He don't just come after a person who is who is solid, you know, who got their game together. He's coming after those. And I'm going to read to you the things, the six areas he comes after us. First of all is your identity. And, you know, I've said this before. He questioned Jesus like Jesus didn't know who he was. Jesus, if you are the son of man. Jesus knew exactly who he was, and so did Satan. But he will attack your identity. If you are truly God's child, if you know you are, there's no question to it. So what you need to do is stand stand strong on what you believe in. He then attacks you if you are a good mother, a good wife, a good husband, a good father. He'll try to attack you on, well, your mate could be doing this or your mate could be doing that. Now that's stirring up fear and worry in you. You got to know your mate. My mate do something like that. No, they're saved too. They're born again. And even if, even if they are, I'm not going to react to it. We have to know who we are. He will accuse you of who you are. I, I hear people say, well, people are saying, I'm this kind of person or I'm that kind of person. And I'm not who, you know, who God said. Well, why would you care what they say? You are to be grounded in who you are because you got to be grounded in Jesus Christ. He'll also attack, attack you when it comes to discord. He is always and forever sowing discord among any kind of relationship, husband, wife, Mothers, fathers, daughters, moms, fathers, sons, friends, church members, co-workers, neighbors. He is always sowing discord. You have to understand that discord. And then he comes at us with misunderstanding. Then he comes with resentment. And then accusations. <laughs> and then envy or jealousies. And I want to take each one of these points and talk about it right now. Because when it comes to being the chosen of God, those who are chosen and who are born again, he's coming after you with your calling. Are you who you think you are? Not a question about it. You know who you are. You stand on it. You know, and then the next he'll come up with this called arguments and conflicts in relationships. Always causing up strife. And when there's this type of type of thing going on, it really hinders the feeling of love. Not that you don't fall out of love, but you're kind of disgusted because why we can't get along? Well, you know, you better check outside of the two of you. This is a satanic attack against your relationship. Can you imagine how much Satan hates relationships? Good, godly, solid, loving relationships. Can you understand the power of two? There's power in two. And he knows that. So he will attack one. Or he will seduce one. Or he will try to tempt one to go against the other. Because God says when two or three comes together in my name, asking anything, I will do it. Satan knows that. He knows the word better than we do. So what would he, what would he do? He would keep the two at odds with each other. I have seen siblings who have grown up from it together and it, sleeping sometimes in the same bed, become adults and have nothing to do with each other anymore because there's discord, there's strife, there's arguments, there's competition. Who is the author of that? Satan is. And so you have to fight and war against him. How do we war against him? Very easy. The Bible just said it. Resist him. Resist the devil and he shall flee. We don't we, we don't we don't go hands up with him. We don't have to. That's God's business. He puts the he puts the angels in his his uh, angels, the archangels do they, they deal with that. We don't have to. Our warfare is strictly in the ability to stand in the light of adversity, to understand, hey, this person is my spouse. This is my husband. They are not my enemy. 
I, I, I vowed to love this person to death. So now we're at odds with each other. Why? Because Satan have you at odds with each other. So and, and somebody got to have some sense and come to their sense and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know where this is coming from. This is the devil. I will not give Satan any control over my life. And that's where we have to stand on that truth. What's the problem? Well, let's talk like adults. Let's talk this over. You know, arguments, arguing over everything. You know, when, when, when everything becomes an argument, you have to know that the enemy is in place somewhere in that situation to come and to steal and to kill and to, just, and to destroy. That's what he do. You know, you look at America right now. When we're talking about discord, look at America. We're so divided. We're so divided even in this racial thing. It is so ridiculous to me. It is, it's absolutely astoundingly stupid to me for people to hate based on the color of a person's skin and the texture of a person's hair. When, when you think about it, you trace it all the way back to Adam and Eve. We all come from Adam and Eve. And then you can definitely say too, we came from Noah's. We, we came from Noah's crew. Our, our ancestors came off that, that, that boat. Why are we arguing? Because we look different. God loves diversity. He absolutely loves it. If you look at the tulips, I think in Holland, I said this before, they come in every color under the rainbow. You look at birds. Birds come in every color, beautiful colors. That's what makes them so beautiful. The colors are different. I'd hate to have all the birds are blue, all the flowers are red. No, God made diversity because diversity makes beauty. Why would I be angry and want to fight against someone because their skin color is different than mine? Why would I hate someone? That is so ridiculous. God is love, and we are to love every human being. No one is above the other. God is above all. We all will bow our knee one day to the sovereign God. So we don't have time to war over what we look like. That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. And to want to get to the place you want to kill somebody, risk your life, whether you kill yourself afterwards or you go to prison, that's ridiculous. God made us to be one. And when you, when, when you deal with people from all different nationalities and ethnic groups, to me, it just, it just makes the world so much better because we're different yet we are the same we feel the same we're human our languages may be different we might look different we could hail from different places but we're still made in the image and the likeness of god so it's absolutely ridiculous to me so you find conflicts over that you, you find arguments over that you find strife over that political issues one, of, one person like one party, the other person like the other party, and they break up and divide, divide over that. God is the one that we need to be bowing to, not our political parties. Have the party you want. It don't matter. But what do matter is God. Are we pleasing him? We're fighting over religion. If you believe that God is God and you worship him as God, cool. Worship him as God. Why is there a fight? Why are there fights about, about um, denominational differences? Because you're in a different denomination. What difference does it make? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You know, do, do you believe that? And those core beliefs that we, we, we stand on. That's, that's the point of unity. We fight about everything and God is telling us, get rid of the discord because this is coming strictly from Satan. United States is divided right now over these issues. God created the United States. He calls us to be here so we can come from different nations, different languages, and, and different, different backgrounds and come into this one place like a beautiful salad bowl and come together and begin to respect one another's differences. I, I think that's what I love the most about America is the diversity of the people. We might look different, 
we might sound different. Let me tell you something. When I when I travel to other countries and I don't know the language, when I hear someone speaking English like me, it's like, oh cool, you know, we're from the same, you know, we're from the same group right here. I don't care I don't care what, what the ethnic group is. They speak English, we can communicate. I was on the elevator one one time down in Brazil. We were going up to see up to Corcovaca where they have the Jesus up there, the top of the mountain. And everybody I had come in contact with spoke uh, uh, Portuguese. I got on the elevator and this this couple was speaking English. And I said, oh, you're from the United States? And they said, yes. And we started talking. And they were from the next state from mine. And we felt like, hey, we, we're like brothers and sisters. Different ethnic groups, same language same country we got to get over this madness of hating ourselves and we got to remember one thing your enemies are watching you want to divide you want to divide you know what will pull us together and attack from the outside why do we have to have that before we respect and honor each other you know in the battlefield it don't matter it does not matter to these people not one bit what state they're from what the ethnic group is, what the you know what accent they have, whether they're from the Midwest, Midwest, whether they're from Minnesota, got a little different accent, whether they're from New York, New Jersey, or they're from Alabama, Mississippi, or Tennessee, it does not matter. Texas got a little different accent too. Then you got New Orleans. We all have different accents, but we come from the same nation that makes us one. Can we not get that? We let Satan divide us. Then there's the next one he divides with yelling and cursing and fighting and even murder because we don't have enough sense to understand who is the instigator. Satan is. Misunderstandings. Misunderstandings. We used to call that the deaf and dumb spirit. That's when someone says something, you didn't understand what they said or you heard it differently. And instead of you asking a person, excuse me, what did you say? Get an understanding. The Bible says, no, all you're getting, get an understanding. Make sure that you understand people so that there be no discord. The next area he hit us in is resentment. Resenting spouses. Oh, spouses can resent one another. Mm -mm -mm. That's a shame when that happens. Brothers and sisters can resent one another. You know, we get parents. Some parents resent their kids for whatever reason. And some children resent their parents because the parents don't do what they say. God forbid. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, we're resenting people who have different views from us. Nobody have to agree with me. I don't care if you don't agree with me. I got my opinions and I'm going to keep my opinions. You don't ever have to agree with my opinion. But I have to, you, you should respect them because I'm going to respect yours. Not, I won't believe yours necessarily. I don't have to agree with you. But we can agree to be disagreeable. We can agree to have our differences and yet respect one another. We have to be agreeable in anything. We might have different beliefs in our, or our views of looking at things. You know, we may have different, you know, our political uh, ideologies may be different. Our values. Now, if your values is different, now that's, that's where I may have a problem right there. You know, I won't, I probably won't deal with you. We body shame people because people look different than, than, than some, another person. A person is heavy, so, oh, they all fat. I can't deal with them. You know, oh, they all skinny. They bones. You know, I can't deal. You know, why? Why? It has nothing to do with you. Lifestyles may be different. Depending on your lifestyle, I mean, you, you live an immoral life. I probably won't fool with you at all. But, you know, but I'm not going to argue with you either. And then we love to argue about money because we end up resenting people on these levels because there is a different opinion or a different uh, way of living than we would live. Satan is the author of that. And then you have accusations. One of the worst things to me is accusations. When they, when a person assumes that, that, that assumption, that demonic assumptions, is assuming that someone believes or thinks like they believe or think, which may not be it at all because you didn't bother to ask them. Satan loves for us to be in this place of assumptions, assuming something about people. Ask them. If you want to know how someone is, ask them. Ask them. Lying, we will lie, there's the accusation, lying on people, not good, not good. We can't, we can't lie, we cannot bear false witness against someone else and think we're standing tight with God. No, nope, don't work like that. The next one I want to talk about is jealousy. Envy goes in there too. Jealousy. 
I have never seen so much jealousy as I see now. So many people are jealous of other people. You know, and, and, and the thing is, because a person may feel inadequate in what God gave them. You know, you may not operate like the next person. I'm, I'm talking about spiritually. You may not operate like the next person in spiritual, like in spiritual. You may have a different gift. God has gifted all of us. All of us who are born again, we got a gift. The Holy Spirit has given all of us something that we are going to do. We may not do the same thing, but that that's no reason to be jealous. Because you're going to operate the way he gifted you, and I'm going to operate the way he gifted me. And we have to know the difference. Then we want to look at uh, when, it, when it comes to jealousy and popularity. You know, uh, some, some kids, some young people can sing, some can't sing. Some can dance, some can't dance. Some have, have uh, very intellectual, they're on debate teams, and they, they, you know, they can debate and stuff. Oh, you're jealous of them. Whatever blessing they have. You got a car, you got money, whatever you got. You got a, a cute wife, and, you know, your, your, the other person's wife may not be cute, and so they're jealous of that. You know, people can be jealous of you, and you have no idea. They can be walking with you like this, and can be jealous of you. You have to know the difference. Who is the author behind that jealousy? When a person feels inadequate, they would be jealousy. And let me tell you this. This is what I learned. A lot of times, and as long as, long as that jealousy and as long as that envy does not lead to harm, I wouldn't care. Because, you know, sometimes that's the biggest flattery they can give you. It is the biggest flattery. They're jealous of you because you're doing something. They really think you more than what you might even think you are. Because they're jealous of your gifts. They're jealous of what you're doing. And you're just doing what what God has equipped you to do. And sometimes you have to step back and say, wait a minute, this person dislike me because I, you know, I operate, I can speak or I can sing or, 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 or I can lay hands on the sick and they get well, or, or I can, you know, I have some spiritual gift. They, they're upset about that. You know, I've known people who've gotten jealous over people because they give away money to the poor. They feel, why didn't you give it to me? because you don't need it you know but but they really will, will become envious and jealous because you have enough money to give away but you're not giving it to them and they don't need it who's the author of that satan so let's look at something your position in life will also make people jealous people will become insanely jealous you got a position and they don't they will become jealous of you God has given you something to do. God calls you to be a minister. You know, I know friends that, that I've had in the past. And I've seen this area of jealousy because someone was called into the ministry. And the other person may have had more education and thought that, well, I'm educated. Why, why weren't I called? I can speak better than that person. Yeah, you, you probably can. But you're not the one God called to do it. He called them. We don't have time to be jealous because you know what all of us, God has given all of us something. If, we are, if we're in him, if we're in Christ, we have, we have some sort of talent. It amazes me what people can, can, can paint or draw. That, you know, some people can hear gospel music and, then, and can draw pictures according to what they're hearing, beautiful pictures. I said, wow, I wish I had that gift. I wish I, had to, I wish I could sing. You know, I would love to be able to sing beautiful songs, you know, before I, before I minister or something like that. I don't have any of that. I'm okay with it. I'm not jealous of anybody who can either. That's not my gift. That's not what God gave me. 1 Corinthians 6. This is what I want to turn to. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. Because we've got to remember something. While we are jealous of people, we got to remember this one thing. Verse 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? Why do we have times to be jealous of somebody when we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and who God gave it? God gave us the Holy Spirit in our temples. So we're just as equipped as the next person. And you are not your own. We're purchased. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now listen, here's a 911 thing for you. Let me just give you, no, not 911, 411. Could be 911 if you don't walk in it. 411, information. It says right here, 
that God gave you his spirit. You belong to God. He said, you are of God. Your body, therefore, is to glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Why? Because they belong to God. How could you be jealous of anybody if you know that everything about you, your gifts, your talents, came from God? I used to play the violin briefly. You know, I used to play the violin. I love the violin. Beautiful, beautiful music from a, from a violin. And I didn't continue because, you know, my parents couldn't afford to buy a violin for me. I was able to use the one at school. And I could have picked it up later in life. I just never did. But I've always loved it. And I can listen to someone play the violin. I don't get jealous about it. I praise God that they can play it. Beautiful music. Beautiful music. We don't have time to be jealous of anybody for what they can do when God has given us something. We are called, first of all, to live a life of denial. We can't be jealous of anybody. If we live a life of denial, that means we deny our own interest sometime because we got to be about that thing called prayer, worship, and praise. And then we, he also called us to a place of cross-bearing where we understand we got to put the Lord over everything. We bear our cross. Then we're in a place of affliction. We got to understand that pain, suffering, hardship, don't let nobody tell you that you're not supposed to walk in that because you're born again. God says, many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You will have afflictions, you will have hardships, and you will have trouble. Understand this. We are called to be holy. Called to be holy. The last scripture I am going to read, because I just love this scripture, and I just know that God is, is really calling us to live in a place where, where we can honor him, and that is Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse uh, 18. It says, for I consider, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We may suffer now, but there's glory that's, that will be revealed. When Satan hits you, understand this. He's hitting you because he wants to knock you off track. You are fully grounded in Jesus Christ. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in your life. So when he comes with you with these attacks, which is... Uh, identity, discord, misunderstanding, resentments, accusation, and jealousy. You can fight against it because you belong to God. Amen. I pray this message bless you.